Ah, oh, Randy. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Excellent. Hey, everybody, say hi to Dr. Randy Sherlock. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad we solved these technical issues before we walk into some of the more tech, most technologically challenging conversations. So thanks, Randy. I was just giving a bit of uh, an intro to everybody, but I will do it again now that you're here so we can frame the conversation properly. <clears throat> which was to say that if you're anything like me, for anybody who's listening right now, and apologies if you are, you may have noticed that there seems to be a growing amount of conversation these days about quantum physics and what quantum mechanics can tell us about the nature of consciousness and reality, frankly. Uh, it's something that I've personally been interested in uh, since uh, you and I actually have been interested in it for a long time, but you and I, Randy, we bonded over this conversation at a restaurant in LA in a world before COVID. And recently the conversation has started to percolate up more and more in um, different media outlets. Uh, the journal New Scientist uh, published an article called A New Place for Consciousness in Our Understanding of the Universe. And more recently, Tim Ferriss interviewed a scientist by the name of Don Hoffman about his book, The Case Against Reality, which circles around the same basic conversation. Inspired by these two events, and because no consciousness conversation is complete without a conversation of psychedelics, uh, we actually invited Thomas Luton, who wrote that article in the New Sci Scientist, to join Randy and I on the podcast last week, uh, which should be coming out fairly soon. But we also thought it'd be a lot of fun to have a more interactive Instagram live conversation about it. So everybody, thank you for joining. And I hope you enjoy as we go deep into some incredibly mind-boggling topics, as far as I'm concerned. So... And Randy, I'm gonna act as the interviewer, but I'll participate in the conversation as well. Uh, but I'll let you take the lead in kind of responding to some of these questions. So in order to talk about quantum mechanics and consciousness, I think we need to have some sort of foundational understanding of what quantum mechanics is and what quantum physics is. And, and before you joined, I was talking about how it's about the really, really small. That Newtonian physics describes the really big, the sense of reality that most people would describe as objective reality, the sort of pool table, billiards table example of if you knock the cue ball, all the balls spread. And if you know the direction of the cue ball and the spin and the force, you can basically predict the future. Everything is kind of linear in terms of how the physical world exists. But when we go into the quantum realm, that doesn't seem to hold up. So with that, first question I have is, what is quantum mechanics and, and what is the theory behind it? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, I heard that you had mentioned that certain people say, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you understand quantum mechanics. And that was attributed to Richard Feynman, um, right. of the you know, premier scientist, quantum mechanic physicist from the 20th century. Um, but quantum mechanics is frequently understood because it doesn't fit with our intuitive notions of the way the world is. And um, what quantum mechanics is at its foundation is simply a mathematical description of the fundamental nature of reality. But where it's weird is that the world as we perceive it is completely different than the way mathematics describes it. And that disconnect between the description, the mathematical description of the fundamental nature of reality versus the different reality that we perceive, that that incongruity is where all the weirdness comes from. Because Erwin Schrodinger uh, generated his eponymous Schrodinger equation in late 1925. It's been nearly 100 years. And in that yeah. time, I've yet to figure out how the math of quantum mechanics really actually relates to the physical reality that we perceive that that's a knowledge gap that is super mysterious totally so two things one is to clarify this is a mathematical description quantum mechanics but we see have seen it validated in a bunch of scientific experiments so it's not just theory this is actually being borne out in in experiments with the large hedron collider in, in switzerland and france and all that kind of stuff <clears throat> yeah and i don't think any the single most accurate theory of all of science and what i mean by accurate is that the theoreticians who calculate what uh, something should be matches perfectly to what the experimentalists 
observed in the lab. And quantum mechanics has now been um, confirmed between theory and measurement to 13 decimal points. Yeah. That's, that's equivalent to the accuracy of measuring the distance between the Earth and the sun to an accuracy of the width of one human. It's really, really accurate. And it's not proven in 100 years of science. It's not a, a single experiment that has disagreed with pretty so, so just talk about this, like every book I've read on the subject starts with a conversation of the double slit experiments. And I think that's a good place to start. So do you want to talk about that as, as a starting point so people can understand how this all came to be? Well, um, because there, I, I, I think that the reason there's so much about quantum mechanics is to start with the double slit experiment. And I okay. think people presume that the theory is only about things that are really the, the reason that um, the zeitgeist of quantum mechanics is about the time is because things that are anything more than one or two particles acting together are very, very difficult to calculate to the lab. And so we've just looked at individual particles. Right. Um, but, but that's where the, the confusion comes from. Because the world that we live in can be described as being made of fundamental particles. That, you know, the Big Bang created a bunch of little Legos. And throughout the evolution of, of the universe, the Legos have come together to make you and me. Randy, can I interrupt you for one sec? Uh, it's a bit choppy coming through. So I don't know if, like, you can move, move the mic for your uh, phone a little bit closer, if you have headphones or something that you could plug into. But... Something's not picking up, or there's some background noise interfering with it. Ooh. Um, well, let me. Um, but but continue. Um, well, let me. Here we go. See the top of Randy's uh, Randy's office. There. Is is that any better? That's much better. Yeah. Thanks, Randy. Much better. Okay. Cool. So the, the, the way to think about quantum mechanics is that what it tells us about reality is that reality is layered. And that classical Newtonian physics that describes the whole world as made out of little particles is the way we perceive it. And that's with very simple mathematics that you learn in high school. Of course, equals Quant mass times acceler acceleration, right? Exactly. Yeah. And Newton yeah. came up with that, you know, many hundreds of years ago. And that single formula, F equals MA, that drove the Industrial Revolution. It's, it's the math that NASA used to get astronauts to the moon. Yeah. Um, it's very robust mathematics, and it's a very, very good description of our world on the scales of tables and chairs and people. Um, but deep buried below everything that we can see, are these rules of quantum mechanics that describe a world of mathematical potential that has nothing to do with individual particles. And in the world of quantum mechanics, it, uses, it describes a world that uses mathematics that's completely foreign to us. Um, there's something called a non-commutative variable that appears in, in quantum mechanics, which basically means A times B does not equal B times A. But that, that's a real physical thing that describes nature at the quantum level. But there's nothing in our world that, that we can see that, that makes sense of that. And, and that, that disparity is where all this weirdness comes from. The other thing that um, shows up in quantum mechanics, and, and Erwin Schrodinger hated it, uh, is the imaginary numbers. So in, in quantum theory... Uh, the square root of negative one actually has a solution. Interesting. <laughs> and there's nothing in our world of tables and chairs where the square root of one has any meaning at all. It's an imaginary complex number. The complex numbers are necessary at, for the world to operate at its most fundamental level, but that's only seen in the realm of quantum theory. And yep. so the, the, the fundamental teaching that we've learned is that the world as we perceive it only appears to be made out of particles, but really what's more fundamental 
are objects in the universe that most people have never heard of before that are called quantum fields. And a field is just a thing that exists spread out throughout the entirety of the universe that can fluctuate, it can move, it can vibrate. And when quantum fields vibrate, that's what we perceive as particles. <coughs> There's a lot there that I think we need to go into. And even though I know you said like the double slit experiment is probably one of the places where it gets confusing, I find it instructive so people can understand how we kind of got here. So correct me if I'm wrong here, but the double slit experiment was a very simple experiment where you imagine having a flashlight, a piece of paper, and then a wall um, that you're aiming the light towards and putting two slits in that piece of paper that separates the, the light, the flashlight from the wall. And when you shine the light, because we know, and this was in part validated by this, this um, experiment that there's something called the duality of a photon, right? A light photon has mass and in that sense is a particle, but it acts like a wave, right? So it, it has this binary kind of uh, characteristic. And so when you shine the flashlight through these two double slits, what we see happening is there's an interference pattern that starts to show up, which makes perfect sense um, if you think about light as a wave, you know, waves, when they interact, they, they reinforce or they cancel each other out and it creates an interference pattern. That, that, that's, there's nothing entirely in, intuitively surprising about that. But what they did with the experiment is that instead of shining a flashlight, they started shooting just individual photons at this piece of paper with two slits in it. And what you would expect under a sort of Newtonian worldview is that a photon would go through one slit or the other. Uh, and that you'd see just like a scatter pattern on the other side, depending on which path the photon took to hit the wall behind it. But what they fact found in fact was they got that interference pattern showing up again, which makes no intuitive sense because it's just a single photon going through either side. So there had to be something essentially interfering with those photons, even though there's nothing actually showing up. That was the basic idea that photons that these particles were acting in ways completely incoherent to how we understand Newtonian physics. And one of the conclude and, and, and as they continue to evolve that experiment, what they found was that if there was someone measuring the experiment, essentially a conscious observer measuring the experiments, the photons acted like particles. So you would get that scatter pattern that you would think would be naturally occurring if you imagine just throwing like a whole bunch of dirt against a wall and someone through two slits. Someone was watching and acted exactly like you'd expect it to when you shot something against a wall. But if someone wasn't uh, observing, if there was no conscious observer, you got this interference pattern again, which really just kind of blew everybody's heads out because all of a sudden the observer, what many people call Occam's razor, the fact that there was an observation <laughs> happening in this experiment actually affected the outcome of this experiment, right? And so out of that, a number of theories kind of emerged and, and we'll get into this, uh, but two, there are two leading ones as far as, uh, as far as I'm aware, I think there's many more, but two leading ones is one that consciousness observing an outcome has a, an impact on the outcome, which is to say, well, actually I'm going to stop there. Tell me if, uh, if there's anything I've said incorrectly to this point about the double slit experiment, Randy. Well, I think that everything you said is the way the vast majority of people would describe the double slit experiment. Um, okay. but, to, but to get a little bit more nuanced, um, if, if we set up in our conversation um, an acknowledgement that the world at our scale appears to be made out of particles and the world at the quantum level appears to be pure mathematics that is a linear partial differential equation um, that has completely different rules, um, one just has to realize that when the double slit experiment is exhibiting wave-like behavior, all that we're doing is we're seeing the activity of that wave level of reality. And that when we're perceiving a particle or an individual photon of light, that's just the way that we perceive the world and the way our um, our scientific instruments perceive the world. And um, 
if you if if a person describes that the, those two levels of of reality if you describe them as being merged together that's when the confusion happens because when you merge one reality has a particle and the other reality has a wave if you squish those together that's when you get this statement where you go well sometimes it's a particle and sometimes it's a wave i would say a more accurate way to describe that is that light is always only photon particles in the classical realm and light is always the wave function in the, the quantum realm. And there's no real mixing. The quantum realm informs the, phys the, the physical realm of what's gonna happen, but they're different things and they're different layers of reality. And squishing them together is where the confusion comes from. Yeah. That's true. Um, that is true. But yeah, I guess it's like, it's natural, like human instinct to say like the, there should be a continuum, which is like what happens here needs to also explain what happens here. And, and that's where the, the, the disconnect happens. And I just wanted to parse out and unpack that concept concept of like fields a little bit. So one of the conclusions that came out of the double slit experiments and, and all of quantum mechanics since is that, um, electrons, photons, basically all matter as we know it actually only exists in a state of probability that you can measure the spin or the direction uh, of, a, of a particle, but you can't measure them at the same time. And that as a result, what happens is everything, quite literally everything in our physical reality seems according to the theory to exist only in a state of probability. And that there has to be some uh, event that causes that probability to collapse from probability into an actual location. So they exist basically in a state of, of quantum fluidity until one of the theories goes, a conscious observer observes uh, whatever is there that collapses the wave function. And then you know exactly what that particle is, right? And, and this is where it starts to get into a conversation about consciousness, right? Um, so, well, 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 let me address that because the, the, that that description you just gave yeah. is essentially the description that Niels Bohr gave us a hundred years ago, and it's still the way that the vast majority of people think of and talk about quantum mechanics. But buried into that that whole talk about collapse of the wave function is this implicit. Um, assumption that the the particle and the wave function are the same thing, right. and and what I'd like to to help us do is separate them as distinct entities to take away the confusion of something having like a particle having properties of being in two places at one time. That that's not what quantum mechanics tells us. A particle is never in two places at once. In the double slit experiment the photon never goes through both slits, but the wave function does, or the wave function can be in two places at once. So when you kind of separate the wave function from the particle, all of the weirdness of quantum mechanics just goes away. Well, that's true. Um, or at least I'll take, take your word for it. I've not as studied on it, but it, it, it makes sense. Um, so what, what does this, um, what does this tell us about the nature of reality? What does this tell us about the nature of consciousness? Let's, let's try and shift the conversation a little bit into um, that realm. Well, when um, quantum mechanics was first being fleshed out in the late 1920s and early 1930s, a number of the fathers of quantum mechanics, n names that people have heard of, like Erwin Schrodinger, Max um, Born, Werner Heisenberg, these guys all came to the same conclusion. They said, holy cow, we used to think that the world was a physical space made out of physical stuff. And we've now come to realize that that's a, only a, an illusion. It's a very, very convincing illusion. Um, but that the fundamental nature of reality is a level of mathematics that's deeper than the level we exist on. And that level of mathematics 
is creating within our consciousness the appearance of a physical world. And that idea didn't really gain much traction because it's so counterintuitive. And then about the time the philosophers were getting involved in, in, in contemplating that, World War II broke out. And right. nobody ever professionally ever went back to that until I'd say the last 20 years. There's been a resurgence in the interest in quantum foundations, um, but there was a very, very long hiatus. And what's the rebirth in, in this interest starting to show us and, and validate? Because, I mean, kind of what you just said is what, as far as I know, many ancient philosophers have been saying since time immemorial that the whole of experience is just an illusion or a dream. Um, and, and now quantum, and this is where it gets mind-blowing, is that that sounds nice in the realm of philosophy, um, but now we seem to find that the most sophisticated advanced science in the world seems to be validating uh, that, that philosophy. So what are we seeing now in terms of the science and, and where it's going and, and the theories behind how to make sense of this? Yeah, so there, there was progress made the, I'd say the first big step that kind of cracked the ice in opening the door to a resurgence to understanding philosophy of quantum foundations was with an Irish physicist by the name of John Bell. He uh, really didn't like a paper that Einstein wrote in 1935, and John Bell spent a lot of his time trying to figure out how to address that. And he came up with... Um, a theorem that could be used to test entanglement. And it was in the 1980s that Alain Aspect in his lab in Paris finally did an experiment where he confirmed that two different particles of light at distances separated um, farther than the time it would take for them to communicate, that they could coordinate their states in real time instantaneously. And that was the very first time we proved that something deeply connected between everything in the world is going on. And that led, that, that ignited the philosopher's interest. Um, and now fast forward to the 2020s, uh, we've got work from Carlo Rovelli who describes the world only in terms of relationships. That a particle doesn't exist until it interacts with another particle. And it's not that those two particles come into existence. It's that their interaction then deposits a bit of information into the space-time matrix that we live in. There's a lot there. I think we should kind of try to, to unpack uh, some of that. So Einstein, some of the things you just touched on was like Einstein was not a big proponent of quantum physics when he was alive. I mean, he wouldn't deny the experimental and mathematical outcomes, but he said things like, I'd like to believe that the moon is still there, even though I'm not observing it, which really goes back to the role of consciousness or relativity, uh, you know, interaction between particles, um, kind of collapsing the wave function in the parlance I talked about. Um, and it also, what you just talked about, entanglement, challenged his notion because part of the general and special theory of relativity uh, E equals MC squared in the most simple forms uh, was that the speed of light was was a barrier that you couldn't nothing could travel sp faster than the speed of light but what this experiment showed was that entanglement happens faster than the speed of light that these two entangled photons or particles could be literally at the other end opposite ends of the universe uh and uh the entanglement would be transmitted instantaneous they, they would they would violate the speed of light is that correct yeah, that's absolutely correct. And, and Einstein's whole problem was that he didn't view reality in, in layers. He, he tried, he, everything to him was flattened to just what's in front of him. And he, he, he thought of those two particles as nothing more than two separate particles. So how in the world could they communicate? But if you realize that, that there's a deeper layer to reality, that at the quantum level, those two pieces of light are actually just part of one mathematical system. It's not weird at all that they would instantaneously communicate. It's like when you're doing a math equation, 
when you do something on the left side of the equation that affects the other side of the equal sign, but there's no time delay. Right. Right. Well, it's just that that's what it. happens in the equation. And that's all quantum mechanics is, is it's a mathematical description of reality. So things have to happen instantaneously. It's the only way it can work. Right. That, that makes sense. That's actually a lot easier way to, to digest it. Because what we're seeing now, and I want to go back to the conversation about fields, because I still haven't fully wrapped my head around it, but some of the things that quantum mechanics tries to explain and seems to get close to explaining are things like gravity. Like why Einstein created this notion of space-time, that gravity is just the warping of space-time. So the classic example given, if you want to think about the orbits of a planet going around the sun, why does that happen? Why is there gravity there? Well, if you imagine the, the sun as a bowling ball and dropped it on a mattress, that mattress will you know, bend towards the weight of the bowling ball. And therefore, anything rolling towards that is going to get caught in in the depression that's made by the bowling ball. And that's effectively how gravity works, that everything that has mass has gravity, gravity, um, mass warps gravity, and, and therefore things are attracted to each other, essentially. Um, but quantum mechanics starts to ex goes deeper to start to explain on, on a field level why gravity exists. It goes. It starts to explain uh, the nuclear forces, the weak force, and the new, the the strong force, which is within every uh, every atom out there. There's a proton, a neutron, and an electron spinning around at, at one level, not the smallest levels, but at one levels. But there's got to be something holding the nucleus together of that atom. There's got to be some force holding it together. And that wasn't explained by, by gravity. Um, and so there's now this field theory. So can you start to unpack field theory and try to put it in a, in a way that's actually comprehensible? Because I still, still don't really get it. Yeah. Um, but first, let's back up because there's, there's an interesting tidbit of history buried in the story you gave. Um, in 1905, Einstein published two papers related to his field or his, his theory of special relativity. And um, one of the things that bubbled out of his work was discovered by his mathematics professor that he himself, Einstein, didn't recognize. And what his mathematics professor, Hermann Minkowski, realized is that although the universe appears to us as three spatial dimensions that are fixed, we don't live in a three-dimensional universe. What Hermann Minkowski figured out from Einstein's special relativity work is that we actually live in a four-dimensional mathematical matrix in which distances and time are related. They're almost the same thing. And that's a, such a difficult concept to wrap your head around that even Einstein didn't get it. He, right. he, he had to get convinced that his own work demonstrates that there's this four-dimensional matrix called space-time that can bend and twist, and that bending and twisting is what gravity is. And so gravity in a, it is not a force. We talk about the force of gravity, but at the end of the day, it's not a force. It's just how things move through bent space-time. Now, what a quantum field is is a quantum field is an object that lives within four-dimensional space-time, and it fills the entirety of space-time. And every single particle that we, that we know of comes from the oscillation of a corresponding field. So every atom has electrons. There's a thing in nature called the electron field. And when it's vibrating in a very specific manner, what we perceive is a little thing called an electron. But there really isn't a little thing made of solid stuff called an electron. It's just like when I go to the beach and I see water moving up and down, I go, oh, there's a wave. But there really isn't a thing called a wave. It's just the motion of the water. The wave isn't an individual separate thing distinct from the ocean. It's just a pattern of movement of the ocean. And that's exactly what an electron is. It's a pattern of movement of a thing called the electron field. Light, it's just a pattern of movement in a field called the electromagnetic field. But there are fields for up quarks, down quarks, leptons, muons, all these things that we call particles 
are just actually vibrations of a corresponding field. And that's, that's in order to prove that theory, that's why we built the Large Hadron Collider at the CERN lab in Europe. It was not to identify something called a Higgs boson, but it was actually just to vibrate the Higgs field and see its behavior. Hmm. I didn't know that. That's super interesting. But it, it does, it does create, give rise to a question, and this is where psychedelics, I think, start to merge into this conversation quite a bit. It's like an electron emerges from oscillations in the electron field you know light emerges from oscillations in the electromagnetic field yet yeah, we, we still perceive these things we don't perceive electrons per se i guess maybe when you get shocked after going down a kid slide too fast you, you understand a little bit about what electron feels like but we perceive them you know we we have sensation we are conscious um how do these two things intersect well, that's exactly what um, the fathers of quantum mechanics were referring to um, when they described the universe as not physical, but entirely mental. Um, Max um, Born and uh, Max Planck, Werner Heisenberg, Erwin Schrodinger, they would all tell you that an electron is the way consciousness perceives the fluctuation of the electron field. Right. And that, the, that it, at its core, the universe is a mind that is vibrating and our perception of physical reality is an extension of that mind's perception of itself vibrating. That is non-intuitive. Yeah, can you, I was about to say, can you repeat that just so we can yeah. digest that a little bit? Yeah, that, that the only thing that exists is consciousness and that the consciousness can vibrate itself according to the mathematics of the Schrodinger equation, quantum mechanics, and in apprehending its own movement you and I as people perceive that as the universe because our consciousness is an extension of the consciousness of the universe just with blinders on so that we forget our true nature. And, and that to loop back to your question about psychedelics, where psychedelics has a critical role to play in this discussion is that psychedelics can help an individual perceive for themselves that their consciousness isn't created in the brain, but that it's actually a property of the universe that manifests everything that there is. And that's not something that can be explained in any scientific terms because it's purely a subjective experience. So it's outside the realm of scientific description. And that's why scientists have been so reluctant to, to talk about this because it's not within science. And our culture has developed this belief that science is the only arbiter of truth and that we've, we've discounted human experiences as, as a valuable teacher of what might be. Yeah. Uh, Erwin, who is a teacher I work with, talks about set theory, which is, you know, set theory is basically understood in mathematics, which is, you know, you can pick all the odd numbers and that becomes a set, right? And so even numbers don't exist within that set. And we can think about our, what we perceive as physical reality or scientific exploration as set theory, which is it's operating within a box and it can't see anything outside of the box, just like within the set of odd numbers, it can't see even numbers. They don't exist in that set. So it's not even measurable within that set. Um, and, and Great and analogy. So yeah, thank you. I, I can't take credit for it, but I will take credit for repeating it. Uh, but it helps it make sense that it's like, and, and actually, this is really interesting. So I've started reading a book called The Case Against Reality by Don Hoffman. Don Hoffman, yeah. And, and his basic thesis is, and I haven't got through the end of it, so I haven't got down to like the, the finite detail, but his, his basic thesis is, is that humans are experience of reality 
ignoring the kind of conversation that we're all just part of like the, the great central consciousness for the time being. But he said, our perception of reality is not necessarily actually mathematically, it's a virtual certainty that what we perceive does not reflect actual reality, that our perception, me knocking on this table, me pushing the button on the iPhone is just our perception that's been developed through natural selection for fitness purposes. That what we see, what we taste, what we smell, what we feel doesn't tell us what's actually out in reality. It's just how, you know, this spacesuit of a body has evolved to give us the best chance at surviving and procreating. Um, and that they're not, they're not tied. They don't, they don't have to be creative. What it actually exists and what we perceive mathematically for sure are not the same thing. It just, it just doesn't exist. Um, and, and let me let me pause you there because that is exactly what quantum theory has been telling us for a hundred years, yeah. and it's been very very difficult for the scientific community to accept that, which which is why Don's work is seen as being pretty far out there. Yeah, and and just so everyone knows, like Don Hoffman, I, I don't remember where he's an academic, but he basically grew up uh, studying with. Uh, uh, Crick and Watson, uh, the founders of the double helix, the DNA uh, structure. Every month, I forget the name of the group, but every month they basically met with the brightest physicists around the world uh, to explore and discuss quantum physics, consciousness, and the nature of reality. And, and this thesis, the case against reality, as, re as reflected in the book, is what kind of emerged for Don Hoffman. And I still think it alienates a lot of people. A lot of people push back uh, against that perspective, but it, it is super fascinating and it, it's really hard to argue against. Well, and, and to be clear for your audience, um, Don's work is predicated on the notion that the only single thing that exists in the universe is consciousness. That, that, that's what his whole work is based on. And he's, he's really done some remarkable work because he's developed a theory about how conscious agents interact with each other. And he's actually been able to derive special relativity and the time-dependent Schrodinger equation from his, his work. And so if he can continue to flesh that out, he may very well have a complete mathematical description of reality based on consciousness. Yeah, that's what I was about to ask. So I was going to elaborate on one point uh, from Don Hoffman, but then um, go back into the, the your last point. And, and the way um, he kind of describes our perception of reality, he uses a computer as an analogy, which is you can double click on your email app and it'll open up and it's an interface to interact with your computer. Our perception of it is that's the computer, but the truth is the the true nature of the computer, at least on one level, is transistors and tubes and electricity and all that kind of stuff. But the email program is our interface, and so our bodies are kind of the interface for our consciousness to interact with the physical reality. Um, and that, you know, the way he describes psychedelics is psychedelics may just put another. Uh, icon on our home screen to click on as a different way to experience reality and, and understand how it works. The second point I was going to make was, and this was the nature of the conversation or the article that Thomas Luton uh, that we talked about last week um, wrote is that people are trying to build the math of consciousness. Like they're trying to, because one thing that makes a challenge with quantum physics and, and consciousness is that the math in quantum physics works so well. You said it's accurate to 13 decimal points or whatever it was. And so inserting a math, a new mathematical constant into what is already a very accurate mathematical equation in terms of its validity against the experimental data uh, creates a lot of challenge, but people are, are trying to solve that now, Don being one of them, but there's other approaches to it as well, aren't there? A handful, yeah. yeah. Um... You know, to me, one of the things that uh, looking for new math is overlooking in quantum theory is what we perceive as randomness is probably not random. So, for example, 
Um, you talked about the double slit experiment, how a particle of light can go down this tube and it either goes through the left slit or the right slit. The question is, how does it decide which path to take? And the standard physics answer is, oh, well, it's random. But if you think about what that means, what that means is that there's some random number generator built into nature. And when this photon has to make a decision, God rolls dice and says, oh, even number, go left. Well, that's part of what Einstein really um, rejected. He said that doesn't make any sense. And for a person who has had a psychedelic experience where the entire world melts away, all sense of yourself melts away, and you're sitting in that self-aware, loving, conscious energy that everything is made out of, it becomes very intuitively obvious that that photon isn't rolling dice, that it's actually just making a choice. And, and that choice isn't built into the mathematics at all. So one could accept consciousness is behind fundamental quantum decisions, but the mathematics of the theory wouldn't have to change one bit. Right. Okay. That's a, that's a easy way to digest it actually. Um, as it comes down to choice and that's the con that's consciousness. Like it, it just is truly the fundamental level uh, of reality. We've only got a couple minutes left uh, in, in our chat. So I saw one question, two questions come in. One is I think a little bit easier to answer and, and uh, um, well, two of the questions came from one person. Yes, this will be available for playback. We'll put it up later and, and edit out the first uh, 10 minutes of me staring confusingly at the camera. Uh, the second question was, can you suggest any groups for a novice to learn more about these topics? Uh, I don't know about groups per se, but there's certainly a lot of books out there. Um, the Case Against Reality by Don Hoffman is one that I'm reading right now. He tries to make it simple. It's not simple, but you know, if you really work at it, you can understand it. He makes it simple enough that if you want to study it carefully, um, it, it, there's enough there. Another book I'm reading right now, and I'm going to totally mispronounce the name, is called The God Equation by Michio Kaku. Um, which really goes into a lot of the conversation about quantum physics, the history about how, and how we got here now. Uh, the God Equation, the full title is The Quest for a Theory of Everything. Um, so it's trying to, I think, to Randy's point, merge the quantum with the Newtonian into a single kind of layer. Um, but I haven't finished the book, so I can't say that with certainty. Um, but Randy, are there any other resources that you might suggest um, that are worth reading or groups to attend? Oh, wow. You know, there's an old book um, from, I think, maybe dating back to the 70s. It's called The Dancing Wu Li Masters. And okay. It was written by a guy named Gary Zukov. And Gary Zukov is a, kind of a renaissance guy because he's steeped into the knowledge of quantum theory. But quantum theory also... His, his studies led him to an understanding of the universe in Buddhist and Hindu terms. And so he's, he's written some other books about spirituality that Oprah Winfrey has really gotten into. So he's been one of the most frequent guests on her show. So you can approach this work from a physics perspective and a spiritual perspective through the writing of Gary Zukov. Okay, that's a, that's a great one. And, and that's an important thing that we don't touch on is like the, the conversation around spirituality, which goes hand in hand with it. But it's also a, a conversation that I think gets a lot of people very defensive that spirituality um, is just like not okay to talk about these days. Um, but the definition of spirituality, which actually seems to be now perfectly validated by quantum theory, is the recognition or feeling or sense or belief that there's something greater than myself, something more than our sensory perceptions. And that's exactly perfectly validated. So spirituality is now scientifically sound, I would argue. Now it can be misconstrued and turn into all sorts of spiritual mumbo jumbo and, and lead people to do stupid things. But at its core, spirituality is perfectly consistent with everything that we're talking about. Yeah, but and you're right that it, it's that word is what I refer to as one of the S words. Sacred, spiritual, spirituality, soul, 
all those S words are, are, are looked at questionably, um, you know, in the world of academia, in the world yeah. of medicine. Because it's hard to test and measure them. Um, but if you go back to that comment about set theory, of course you can't measure them. It, it lives outside the set. Right. Um, with that, we got two minutes left, Randy. Is there anything else that you think we should hit on before we sign off uh, or anything else you want to touch on? Otherwise, I'll just thank you for uh, being here and being a part of the field trip story and, and this conversation overall. It's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just sign off with um, a quote from Sir Arthur Eddington. Who I, I think I've shared this with you before, but in 1928, he wrote a book called The Nature of the Physical World. It was basically a description of what science was understanding um, through the advent of quantum theory and that there, there, you know, like I said, there's this quantum level that informs our level of reality. And about that, Arthur Eddington said, something unknown is doing, we don't know what. And that, that's still true today. Yeah. Till the on point. It's such a great quote. It is. Uh, it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, Randy, thank you so much for sharing this hour with me. Uh, I love this conversation and look forward to uh, going much deeper on it and, uh, you know, continuing to work with psychedelics to help people experience this more on a much more visceral level and uh, hopefully help scientists. You know, I think that's what we talked about the first time we met is how can we take the awareness that psychedelics can provide uh, and put that into the scientific and academic communities so they can think in ways far outside the current realm and uh, still a very much an ambition of mine. And so this has been a great conversation to dip a toe into that and then hopefully we'll keep moving forward. Well, and to any of your listeners, if, if you're interested in learning more about this stuff, anybody's welcome to contact me at the field trip Santa Monica clinic. Sounds great. Um, do you want to share any email or what's the best way to do that? Uh, yeah, randy at fieldtriphealth.com. Awesome. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for tuning in. Really appreciate right, your attention and have a great afternoon or morning wherever you are in the world. Take care. Bye, everyone.